Good evening, friends. Steve Benoon here with Israeli News Live, and I, I don't even know. I think we might post a video here on Patreon to start with. Uh, we will make it public, though, because all of my teachings are always made public, uh, mainly because I've already ran the news today, and I don't like to overlap videos like that. At any rate, though, I do have some very interesting broadcasts still yet coming up uh, uh, in the in the uh, video there with uh, Ariel Tzedak. He also mentions about how how the United States was founded, on what principles and basis. I think you're going to find that one interesting, especially in light of the teachings that my wife does. Uh, and, and also, too, I'm hoping that she's going to get back very soon and, and more frequently on the broadcast here. Um, and we're going to be doing our first disclosure of the events that have happened that have so tragically affected our family. Uh, that will be coming up starting in parts. The first part will be com coming up very soon there. So we're hoping to get all that going for you. But let's go right into this message here. Um, I started off with a couple of images that I wanted to share with you. The first image, of course, being 70 AD when Titus the Roman general comes down uh, through many, many uh, different battles and conflicts and finally ends up destroying Jerusalem, uh, the temple more specifically, uh, fulfilling the prophecy that Jesus made, not one stone would be left here upon another. Uh, that prophecy there, as we see here depicted, uh, let's see, I believe this is the one where it's at here. Uh, actually, no, I'm looking at, I want to go to Matthew right here. This is in Matthew 24, verse 1. After reading, what's interesting though, think about this now, after reading Matthew 23, where he likens the Pharisees into vipers and serpents. Not only that, uh, over in chapter 23, we find out uh, the, a whole lot of other things, too, that they were that I brought out in um, uh, a previous video that I'd done before. Let me just see if I had any of that highlighted here. Uh, let's see. Oh, gosh, no, I don't think I have a highlighted. Uh, Woe unto you blind guides. Uh, which say, whosoever, I think it's actually verse 16 here. Let me just take real quick. Well, I don't want to lose our spot that I have here on the Hebrew Matthew already. And so what I will do here, let me just quickly pull that up on the Hebrew Matthew um, in a separate particular uh, verse there. The reason why I bring this up is because just because we're setting the stage of this whole message that I'm doing here. And that was Matthew 23. So we have here in verse 33, the serpents, etc. They were the seed of the vipers. But if you remember, verse 24, I believe, is where it's at. And I'll blow that up to be sure. Um, yes, Zara, right there. There you have right there, Zara, offspring of blind leaders. No, they're the seed of the blind leaders. And if you remember, I talked about Semael is what Satan was called also, which means God of the blind. So pretty provocative information that we're looking at here. So we go back to Matthew uh, and, and going back to Matthew 24, you know, first Matthew 23, Jesus indicts them, indicts the generation, the Pharisees, indicts the sages. Some people say, I actually got a message in the comments about, they were wondering if I was going to mention the, uh, the Sadducees. Well, I didn't because in this particular case here, Jesus doesn't mention the Sadducees in this indictment. He mentions Pharisees and sages. But when we go into verse chapter 24, now they're coming out. Uh, they went out from, from the temple area and departed from the temple. And his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See you not all these things. Verily I say unto you, there shall not be one be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, if you've ever done the tour in uh, Jerusalem where you have the Temple Mount wall going underneath there, you will literally see those stones on the ground from the Temple Mount where they had been thrown down, just one of the places where they had been thrown down there. Uh, and they weren't put there by Jewish people. That's The stones were literally thrown down there. And I know that there's been a lot of debate, is that the real place of the Temple Mount? Some people are saying that was a Roman fortress. That's completely false as well. I did an amazing interview with Roddy Brown uh, out of Israel uh, years ago, and uh, we posted that on our channel there uh, about the temple. If you look up the temple uh, on my channel, you might be able to find that video. Uh, but one thing that was interesting, too, is that later I discovered in the Hebrew Matthew that the fortress where they would go and get the donkey or the donkey or the donkey was gotten for 
Jesus, the, the one that he would ride in on triumphant into Jerusalem, was taken from the opposite side. You can read it, you can tell it's the opposite side of uh, the Kidron Valley. And it was said in the Hebrew Matthew that that was where the fortress was. So the Roman fortress was opposite of the, on the Kidron Valley on the other side there, which uh, I found to be very enlightening on that subject. So going back though, <clears throat> Like I said, I was showing the images here of the destruction of the temple here. Uh, but more importantly, what I wanted to focus on is the, the, the veil being rent uh, from the top to the bottom. And ironically, if you think about it, the veil being rent and then the destruction of the temple itself are truly types and shadows. Uh, recently... And this is what kind of inspired me on this subject here. As I was doing studies in ancient documents, I was looking at one particular Egyptian document that spoke about that exact subject as well as the renting of the veil as an imagery, as a type and a shadow. And even though it's a type and a shadow, I'm going to share with you uh, through multiple sources that we have here, including the Dead Sea Scrolls, biblical accounts, just how corrupt the temple had become. Because if you think about it, the temple should have been a holy site, a holy building. But in reality, God said he did not dwell in temples made by hands. So even though David wanted to build uh, the Lord a temple to dwell in, that was not God's idea. That was David's idea. Uh, and then Solomon ends up, we find out in the book of 1 Kings chapter 11, corrupting the whole thing. And I believe that it was corrupt even at the time when Jesus came there. Let me read to you, though, from this particular document here. The mystery of truth are revealed through the, through, excuse me, are revealed, though in type and image. The bridal chamber, however, remains hidden. It is the holy in the holy. The veil at first concealed how God controlled the creation. But when the veil is rent, and the things inside are revealed, this house will be left desolate, or rather will be destroyed. And the whole inferior Godhead will flee from here, but not in the Holy of Holies, for it will not be able to mix with the unmixed light and the, um, let's see, and, and the, but, but not in the, excuse me, uh, flawless fullness, but will be under the wings of the cross under its arms. Okay, now I wanted to bring this out because even though, and they say right off the bat that it is a type, it's a shadow. Uh, it's, a, it's shadowing us as the temple of God, but the natural temple that's set in Jerusalem was a type of the human body. Uh, it is a type of us being filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy of Holies, within our heart being filled with the Holy Spirit there. But at the same token, though, he, they mention in here that once the veil was rent, it revealed this house will be left desolate or rather will be destroyed. And that serves in a twofold fashion. The veil of the temple itself was torn from the top to the bottom. And it was in 70 AD, 70 years later, that the temple was actually destroyed. All right. And we know that, too, because if you remember the scripture, um, let me see which one that is. I think it's this one right here. Matthew chapter 23. And this is part of that indictment where Jesus says, in order to place upon you the blood of every righteous one which has been poured out upon the earth from the blood of Abel, the righteous into the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you killed between the temple and the altar. Truly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation and upon Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and removes those who are sent. How many times I wish to gather your children as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you would not. Therefore, you will leave your houses desolate. Now, in this case here in the Hebrew, uh, you are literally looking right there, Baethem, your houses, Charavot, 
desolate in the plural. So he's not talking about the temple. He's not prophesying here about the temple being destroyed, although he does in chapter 24, but he's, he's prophesying of their own, their own bodies. He's prophesying that because they would not hear his voice, that they were going to leave their bodies, their temples, their houses would be left desolate. In other words, there would be no infilling of the Holy Spirit for them because they had rejected him. Then he says, truly I say to you, you will not see me henceforth until you will say, blessed is our Savior. Now that's provocative, verse 39. If you take verse 38 and 39, that is so provocative, it's not even funny. And that's why I often have to just say to you, think deeply about what you're hearing. Because some of these things here, you're going to have to really think deeply. You go to try to really help people to understand what's going on, you know, people just think you're nuts. But it's not my words, it's what Jesus said. And I can't change what he said, I can only say what he said. But then he goes into that type as a shadow, see? Then if we find in chapter 24, it came to pass when Jesus went out from the temple, as he was going, his disciples drew near to show him the buildings of the temple. He said, you see all these, truly I say to you that all will be destroyed and there will not be left there one stone upon another. You know, the writings where, they, where it talks about Jesus and the renting of the veil, uh, there have been other commentaries that have been written from a historical standpoint about this uh, from thousands of years ago there where Jesus, uh, when, when it speaks about him renting the veil, and they, and they use the verbiage that Jesus took with his own hands and rent the veil, but it's actually talking about of his own body. In other words, that spiritual veil, he rent that veil to step out of that body so to speak. So there's so much that could be said, so, so many analogies, it's not even funny there. But now, in, in saying these things though, if you notice though, that what I was reading to you a moment ago though, it mentions in here, in this Egyptian document there, that he says here, but when the, when the veil is rent and things inside are revealed, this house will be left desolate, or rather will be destroyed. Now I don't have the original language to compare this to, so I, I you know, and it's Greek and I wouldn't be able to do it in the first place because I don't, I don't speak Greek, don't, I can't read Greek. But even as I look at this here, everything seems to be in the singular. So it appears to be that it's speaking about the temple, but in type. But when the veil is rent and things inside are revealed. All right. And that's what I focused on. When the veil of the temple, let's take a look at the image again on that, was rent or torn down and opened up, the things that were inside were revealed. It's the same thing with the human heart. When the veil of your temple, your body, is torn, what's in your heart? As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he, right? Let's pull that scripture up there, just, just so we have it there, all right? Thinketh, heart, and I think that's exactly the way it is there. Yeah, here we go, Proverbs 23, 7. For, for as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he, to, to you, but his heart is not with you. So as he thinks in his heart, that's what he really is. So a lot of times people make mistakes in life and they're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I did this and everything. But the thing is, God judges by the heart. In this case, what we're looking at as we're talking about these things though, is that when your veil of your temple, in other words, in your death, when your veil is rent so that you can leave your body, you're dying. The things that are in your heart will be revealed. There's another scripture that talks about that. Nothing will be hidden from him. All right. So the point is, though, is I wanted to look at this. And like I said in this here, he goes, and the whole inferior Godhead will flee from here. 
but not into the Holy of Holies. Now again, you got to remember, it said at the beginning, though in type and in image. So that told me that when the veil of the temple was rent, and it said an inferior God, or Godhead, will flee from here, then no doubt the idolatry and the symbolism that Solomon had set up, albeit he was making other temples for his wives, his pagan wives, etc., but there is also evidence of things being brought into the temple. So what really was hidden behind the veil is what I wanted to begin to examine. And was there documentation to back that up, that there were indeed other things hidden behind the veil? All right, now let me take you to the book of Kings real quick before, and I didn't put it in that order, but we're going to look at this real quick. First Kings chapter 11, Melachim. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women besides the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zedonians, and the Hittites. Do we forget that all these races right here are what brought the giants? They brought the Nephilim into the world, into the country that was in the modern state of Israel, or the old state of Israel back years ago. I believe that's Numbers chapter 13, if I'm not mistaken. I'll just quickly look at that just for a quick reminder, because I'm almost positive that's where that is at. Um, for those that may not know, maybe it's your first time here. Yep, there it is right there. And you have to remember, this is when the children of Israel had been, they came out to spy out the land. This is before Solomon's time. <clears throat> they came to spy out the land. There were giants there. Um, we came into the land, whether, whether uh, you sent us, and surely it flows with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. So they brought back the fruit. Howbeit the people that dwell in the land are fierce, and the cities are fortified and very great. And wherever we saw the children of Anak, Amalek dwelleth in the land of the south, and the Hittite, and the Jebusite, and the Amor Am Amorite dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanite dwell by the sea, along by the side of the Jordan. Now Caleb, Caleb stilled the people toward Moses and said, We should go up at once and possess it, for we are able to overcome it. But the men that went out with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they spread an evil report of the land, which they had spied out into the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have passed um, is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. All the people that we saw in it are men of great stature, now, when it said they spread an evil report, it didn't mean that they lied. They were just making it sound evil like they could not overcome. The evil report was a lack of faith. That's the evil report. And then it says, and there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come, and by the way, when it says he comes, B'nai Anak, mean ha Nephilim. Enoch was from a fallen angel, not a, not, not Nephilim. He's not a Nephilim. Well, he is a Nephilim, but his father was a Nephilim, a fallen one. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, so were we in their sight. So there were giants in the land. Now, the point being here, as we're looking, going back into the, uh, the book of Kings here, is that Solomon... Married in amongst those. Concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, You shall not go among them, neither shall they come among you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Notice gods, plural. Their gods. Solomon did cleave into these in love. <laughs> he cleaved to their gods with love. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and there are 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not whole with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. We go down to verse 6, and Solomon did that 
which was evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord as did his father David. And then Solomon built a high place for the for Kechemesh and uh, the de detestation of Moab and the Mount uh, that is before Jerusalem, and for the Molech, the detestation of the children of Ammon. And so did he for all his foreign wives, and offered and sacrificed unto their gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon, because his heart was turned away from the Lord and the God of Israel, who had appeared unto him twice. And he had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which the Lord commanded him. And yet God had appeared unto Solomon two times. And he still went after other gods and did this very evil thing there. Now notice, like I said, this Egyptian document said when the veil of the temple would be rent. It says here, but when the veil is rent and the things inside are revealed, this house will be left desolate or rather will be destroyed. And the whole inferior Godhead will flee from here, but not into the Holy of Holies. Where it will not be able to mix with the unmixed light with the flawless uh, flawless fullness but will be under the wings of the cross so see you didn't have to worry about the soul being contaminated in this case here but those gods plural would leave now you say steve no only the true father was in there and behind the veil well i would have wanted to believe that as well but then as I was studying the Dead Sea Scrolls, I find out something different. And this is where it gets very, very interesting. Notice right here, effigies of shining spirits. Now, we know we're in the Holy of Holies. We know we're in the temple because it's right here written in this particular Dead Sea Scroll. This is 4Q405. It is also called... Um, uh, the sheer shock, I believe. It's also called the Melchizedek scroll, etc. Let me just read here for you just for a moment. We're going to look at a couple of different places. And the figures of gods, plural, praise him, spirits of figures of glory of the days of the wonderful inner shrines, spirits of eternal divinities, all figures of the inner shrine of the king. Now you would think when it says king, it's not the temple, but it is the temple. The king's works of the spirits of the wonderful vault are intermingled, purely spirits of knowledge of the truth and of justice and the holy of holies, effigies of the living gods, effigies of shining spirits. Now, a lot of times people would say to me, they would say, Steve, the word Elohim, we know it's a plural, but in Hebrew it's taken as a singular. That's true in most, most cases. I would agree with that in some cases there. But here's where we have the problem. We're actually looking at the same document, but the Hebrew aspect of it, it's a little different part of the document there. It's, uh, it's where you, in, if, in other words, if I had kept reading down for you, we would have got to this part here because this is where it's going to be write, uh, translated in the English as the spirits of the gods and the life's uh, uh, from, from which they, they walk or travel, okay? But I want to point out to you something very interesting. The Hebrew language is constructed different than that of the English language. In other words, like for example, if we have a plural noun, your verb has to be pluralized if indeed the noun is meant to be taken as a plural pluralization. Uh, or the adjective, etc. Anything that describes it or the action thereof in Hebrew becomes plural. So if we were to say in English, like for example, um, uh, well, the spirit, uh, the spirit of the gods uh, uh, were walking, uh, well, well, we'll say the spirit of the gods were walking together. We just use the word spirit as a singular because we know the word gods in English is plural. We don't pluralize. We don't say the spirits of the gods uh, walks together. We don't do it like that. I mean, we could use the word spirits, but we could also just use the spirit of the gods because we're pluralizing it just by the mere fact that it's gods. In Hebrew, it would in order for the word Elohim to be considered as a singular, then the verb or the adjective has to be singularized as well. 
So it would have to be Ruach Elohim, okay? In this case here, what we're looking at on the page that you're looking at highlighted right now, this first word right here, the, if I just highlight that part, that's the word Ruach. That means spirit. But when we have Ruachot, we now have spirits in the plural. So therefore, the Ruachot Elohim definitely now has indicated to any Jewish or Hebrew person that the gods is plural because the Ruachot is also plural. All right. The Chaim is the life force. That's also pluralized. If it was speaking of only one God, it would actually just use the Chet Yod Chai. It would be, then it would read Ruach Elohim Chai Metahalech. And again, when we get into the part about the word walking right here, the, the Halech is, uh, is to walk or the, to, the walk. But the Yod Mem there is pluralized once again. And I hope I'm not losing you on this. It's very important to understand this, though, because this particular Dead Sea Scroll document is identifying that there were multiple gods in the temple. Now, it's not that there are multiple gods per se, but the effigies, the, uh, let me go back to where we were at here a moment ago here. In the Holy of Holies, effigies of living gods, Okay, effigies of shining spirits. Shining spirits? Like amber-fired looking type of things. Uh, going back, in, in fact, I know there's people that there's disagree with the way it's translated, but if you were to go back and say in the book of Numbers, when we were talking about the other day, the seraphim uh, make thee a fiery serpent. Uh, verse 8 there. El Moshe Ose Lecha. Uh, to Moses, uh, uh, make to you sarif. Okay, it doesn't even use the word serpent in that particular context there. Just uses the word sarif, but we know it's serpent because of the uh, antecedent up here where we have me'aleinu et chanachash. But that's actually speaking about where they were begging Moses to take the serpent from ruling over them. Uh, but in verse 6, so the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. All right. Uh, Again, now we're pluralizing the word serpents. And chaserafim. Chaserafim. This pluralized, which is winged, or like I said, they're translating this fiery. Um, I know Tzedak, uh, Ariel Tzedak, Claims that this means just uh, uh, winged, I guess winged, uh, uh, winged ones there. But the point is, is uh, this is actually the me memory me mechon memory is translated by the Jewish people, and they translate it as fiery. So as uh, you know, he says sorafim, and I, I don't know the argument on that. I've never really gone deeply into that issue there. But the point being is, is that those serpents that came out were winged flying serpents that were attacking and biting the children of Israel. And then when they cried out to Moses to take away those, those serpents, instead of asking him to take away the serpents, plural, like what were attacking them, they just asked him to get rid of the one that was ruling over them. And it was done in the singer. Singular, not Hashim. No, not Hashim. Now they want to get, so they, they mistranslate this in English. And I think that's done intentionally. Then he goes on. Okay, so he said, The Lord said unto Moses, Make unto you a, 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 a fiery, a winged fiery one there, which they put serpent, they inject that in there and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So, and again, um, that's just, I, I bring this out because also, too, you're dealing not only with the pluralization, etc., but you're also dealing with the fact that they ended up having the serpent, that reptilian devil out of the Garden of Eden, ruling over them uh, while they were on the wilderness journey. And Moses had to get rid of that devil. All right, so 
you know, so this evil that is going on seems to be prevalent for quite some time. So um, also brought that out because of the fact of the shining spirits or the figures of the effigies of gods engraved around glorious effigies of the brickwork of the splendor and the majesty. Living gods are all in the construction and the images of their figures are holy angels beneath the wonderful inner shrines is the calm sound murmur of God's blessing. Uh, the king, can, okay. Now, when you look at this, and this here, we're looking at this in, um, uh, this is in uh, column six. So if we just go up to column six and we want to look at verse five, for example, we'll scroll back up. Here we are. There's verse five right there. And again, um, Kodesh, Kodeshim, okay, the holy of, in the Holy of Holies. Elohim, Chaim, okay, Tzorei, Ruachot. Again, we're having the pluralization. You have the effigies that are there, and, and everything is in unison in the plural. Chaim is plural. Tzorei is plural. Ruachot is plural. Marim is plural. All right, everything was pluralized, showing that the word Elohim in this case here, in this context, is God's, in, in fact, just as they translated that in the English language. It's not a singular God, it is God's plural. So when we saw here in the Egyptian document that when the veil of the temple was rent and the things that are inside are revealed, he said, this house will be left desolate or rather will be destroyed. So the temple, the second temple, had become a disgrace. Jesus first rent the veil which revealed what was behind that veil, what was going on. We find here in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and I don't know if that's behind the veil or what, but uh, definitely the temple had all kinds of effigies of gods, plural, other gods. Why? And not only that, because the veil of the temple is torn and what's revealed inside, almost like looking into the heart, you know, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. That's how God judges you is what's, when, what's in your heart. Not what you do on the outside, what you hold in your heart. And then the fulfillment was that the temple was going to be destroyed as well. Not just that the veil is rent, but now it's going to be destroyed and it was. Now, the odd thing is the very Pharisees and Sadducees that built that temple, Jesus had already referred to them in Matthew 23, verse uh, 24, ye blind guides, literally in the Hebrew Matthew, seed of the blind guides. In other words, they're, they're the children of the ones that were blind that couldn't see nothing. And uh, also... You serpents, you generation of vipers, or seed of vipers. We know according to Ezra's prophecy, chapter 9, they mingled the seed, the holy seed, amongst those nations, just like Solomon had already done it. It wasn't like the Pharisees did anything different. They were just following along with what Grandpa Solomon had done. I mean, it's disgusting what we begin to find out as we look at these scriptures there. Uh, and then we take Amos. No wonder. Look, look what Amos has to say about this as well, right? Um, Amos chapter 5. Hate the evil, love the good, and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord thy God, the God of hosts, will be gracious unto the remnant of Joseph. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of the host, the Lord of lamentation shall be in all the broad places, and they shall say in all the streets, Alas, alas, they shall call the husbandmen to mourning and proclaim lamentation to such as are skillful of wailing. I thought that was kind of interesting. Well, you got to hire somebody to cry? In all the vineyards shall be lamentation, for I will pass through the midst of you, says the Lord. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. Wherefore would you, be, would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light. As if a man did flee from a lion and a bear met him. 
and went into a house and leaned his hand on the wall, and a serpent bit him. Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it? I hate and despise your feasts. This is the God of Israel talking to his own people. I will take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Yea, though you offer me burnt offerings, your meal offerings, I will not accept them, neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beast. Take you away from me the noise of your songs, and let me not hear the melody of thy psalteries, but let justice well up as waters, and righteousness as a mighty stream. That in itself is a prophecy of the coming of Jesus Christ, and yet he also had rejected everything that was being done in the temple. Right? Let justice well up as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. Do you remember what happened in the book of John? Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, Jesus, remember Jesus comes there. He says, There cometh the woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. The disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then say, said the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it you being a Jew ask a drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? The Jews have no dealing with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that says to you, Give me to drink, you would have asked of him. And he would have given you living water. What did Amos say? But let justice well up as waters, and righteousness as a mighty stream. The woman said unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then have you this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, gave us the well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinks of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Now we know the rest of the story. She, she says, um, he tells her to go get her husband. She says, I have no husband. He said, well, you said the truth. You've had five and the one you're living with now is not yours. You know, it almost sounds like Israel as well, doesn't it? You know, if Jesus were to say, go get your husband. If they were looking at Yahweh to truly be their husband, or Jehovah, however you want to pronounce his name. Go get your husband. And Israel might say, well, I don't have a husband. God's forsaken us. Well, you'd be saying the same to them. Yeah, you're, you're, you're right. He has. Because you've had how many? Five or 500 husbands. Because they had forsaken God. The Bible says they have forsaken the fountains of living waters and had hewed them out cisterns that hold no water. You remember that one there? Let's look that up real quick too. Let's just look it up. Let's see. Let's see, where is that? Let's see. I was hoping to pull this up by the word cistern, but I don't remember how it's listed. Um... Maybe I can do it this way here. The hold no water, broken. Yep, here we go. Jeremiah 2, 13, right here. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Is Israel a servant? Is he a home-born slave? Why is he spoiled? All right. And let's back up verse 11, chapter Jeremiah 2, 11. Hath a nation changed their 
gods which are yet no gods but my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit be astonished O you heavens at this and horribly afraid be you very desolate says the lord for my people have committed two evils they have forsaken me the fountain of living waters and hewed them out cisterns broken cisterns that can hold no water so yes Israel had all kinds of husbands. Uh, they had already forsaken their God and had taken other gods instead. As we find in the Dead Sea Scrolls, clearly mentioning that they had effigies of gods, plural, all through the temple itself, on the walls, the bricks, the mortars, everything you could think of, they were doing that. And then it's no wonder then that, uh, that Paul in the book of Acts also mentions the very uh, scriptures of Amos when he says, Yea, you took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Remphan, figures which you made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as, we, as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses, that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen. And of course, what was the difference in that one there? That one was made with skins. See, as a type of the human body, you're made with skins. So at any rate there, listen, I just want to share this little bit here with you uh, today. I hope it's a blessing for you. God bless you. Thank you for listening. And, uh, and if God lays it upon your heart to support the work we do, you can see our website above my head there, IsraeliNewsLive.org. You can donate right there online or via mail. Danoon Institute, P.O. Box 156, Sunbright, Tennessee, 37872. It's right there on our website, the mailing address. Uh, but also, you can do that uh, by, um, uh, 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 or Stephen Benoon, my name, either way, you can do it other way. But if you just click that little link there, donating online, uh, that goes directly uh, into our PayPal part. It doesn't matter if you have PayPal or not. You can donate with any credit card. If God lays it upon your heart that what we uh, share with you is a blessing to you, then please consider supporting the work that we do. Also, our Patreon, IsraeliNewsLive.com. Uh, excuse me. Patreon forward slash Israeli News Live. All that will be in the description below. Thank you for listening, and God bless you.